The last performance I did live uh, with the usual musicians, uh, singers and dancers I performed with uh, was in St. Patrick's Cathedral on March the 12th, 2020. Uh, and uh, the day afterwards, uh, a concert that we were scheduled to do, a lot of us at Symphony Space, an annual concert for the Irish Arts Centre, uh, a Celtic Appalachian celebration was cancelled. Uh, no concerts forthcoming and uh, off I went as I usually uh, do at this time of the year uh, to Bangkok, a city I've been coming to and enjoying for over 21 years now. And uh, the country itself uh, was fairly open at that time. I arrived here on March the 15th. Um, and uh, without my instruments, uh, fully expected to go back for the summer festivals in the Catskills and then the Milwaukee Irish Festival. But then after a while it became apparent that none of this was going to happen. Uh, and uh, Thailand itself locked down. Uh, and has been essentially in lockdown now for uh, over uh, 14 months. And I've been here most unexpectedly that time, uh, during that whole time. Um, the first consolation, I suppose, uh, it's something I've been doing for many years, was going every Sunday morning to the Mercy Centre. It's a, a place that takes care of street kids uh, in the slums of Bangkok, an area called Tlong Doi. And it's been supported over the years by a number of donors and philanthropists, including the legendary Chuck Feeney, whom I have enjoyed meeting many times over the years in San Francisco. And uh, some years back, um, I had the idea of uh, maybe introducing some music into the programs uh, that the kids do after school. And it started very modestly. And then uh, with support, first of all, from uh, Terry Miller, uh, uh, an ethnomusicologist from uh, Kent State, Professor Emeritus from Kent State University, an expert in Southeast Asian music and the person who's become a great friend. Um, with his support in buying uh, extra instruments and then when the mighty Donny Carl, uh, the Corkman of the year in New York on more than one occasion, when he uh, came and saw the Mercy Centre, we started to do fundraisers and have been doing so now for a decade and raising money from a lot of very generous people in New York uh, and in other parts of America and indeed beyond uh, to support uh, an ever growing orchestra, we would call it now, uh, where all the kids are involved at the Mercy Centre. They're all street kids. They've gone through unimaginable horrors on their way to living at the Mercy Centre. It represents the gold standard of how to take care of children in need, the poorest of the poor. Um, and to our delight, they started to get really into the music and, uh, and the dancing. And not just any particular kind, the traditional music, particularly of the northeast of Thailand and the ancient, venerable, beautiful, classical music traditions. Um, we were able through our concerts uh, in New York to fund some of the best teachers who made a major commitment to the, to the kids. Um, and to go there on a Sunday morning and watch them practice in little groups uh, and then come together to do their to their music and dance programs was absolutely exhilarating. And it was something that started to happen Sunday after Sunday. And I started to get to know the kids uh, on an individual basis uh, in a way that I'd never had really the chance to do before. It's always such a joy to watch them, first of all, rehearsing and practicing and then performing. Well, here I am today in the usual Sunday morning practice session. And I thought today what I would do would be to bring you around to the different little groups that practice at different levels and different instruments, both music and dance. The music would be uh, classical and traditional Thai music, and the dance would be associated with those traditions as well. And they break up in little groups. They meet at 8 a.m. every Sunday morning with their wonderful teachers. And they're all highly qualified and very committed to coming out here to the most uh, 
I suppose the most dangerous part of Bangkok in the history uh, of, uh, of slums now is not as dangerous as it used to be. It's changed. Uh, things have, have uh, progressed since the first time I came here 20 years ago. But the music and dance program is a very important part of the activities of the Children Weekly. It's one of the few times they all come together. Uh, they go to different schools, different levels, and uh, one of the first things they do when children enter an institution like this, usually because they've fallen through all the cracks of society, is that the institution prepares them immediately for leaving the institution from day one, uh, even though they're cared for uh, in an exemplary way. Um, they're taught and trained not to be dependent on the institution, a kind of what they call institutional dependency, and can prevent personal and, and uh, community progress. So uh, today I'm going to take you around to the different groups uh, that are practicing at different levels. Later they will all come together. <laughs> As the world now knows, uh, the appalling murder of George Floyd happened on May the 25th, 2020. Uh, and uh, I, along with just about everybody else I know, was appalled uh, beyond belief uh, at, at the murder itself, but also uh, at, at the issue of police brutality uh, and systemic racism. Not that this was a new thing, but it was really highlighted in a new way with unprecedented protests and the story is well known at this point. Being in lockdown on the other side of the world, uh, of course I felt a sense of helplessness, but then I thought, well, you know, we can be connected in a new and a novel way. And Zoom had started and other ways of communicating from afar had been underway for a little bit. Uh, and I started to contact Irish musicians, mostly in America, uh, musicians, singers and dancers, and asking them if they would be interested in making a collective statement of solidarity uh, with our uh, brown and black brothers and sisters, and the indigenous people in America too, uh, to show how appalled that we were and are at racism uh, in, in whatever way it manifests itself. And to my uh, total delight, uh, over 36 musicians, singers and dancers said, we'd love to make a statement. The question is how we would do it. We'll enter an old friend of mine, Roy Esmond. Uh, he's a very distinguished filmmaker, has been in documentary film for over 50 years. We've known each other going back to the 1960s. And almost in desperation, I called up Roy and asked him for some technical advice on how to do this and how to put it all together. And Roy said, look, I'll do it. And I said, do you know what you're getting into? He said, well, I'll learn soon enough. And he did. And to, uh, to all our, our delight, uh, on the 24th of June, 
uh, a program aired uh, called Infinite Hope. I'd like to thank uh, my fellow uh, musicologist uh, and banjo driver Dan Neely for suggesting that famous Martin Luther King uh, term. Uh, we used Infinite Hope uh, to bring ourselves together in solidarity, making a, a statement against racism in whatever form that it might occur. And it was wonderful to see uh, people, you know, who perform in non-verbal art forms like playing jigs and reels and hornpipes, instrumental music, or dancers coming together with people who have songs with lyrics that lend themselves more easily, I suppose, to, to the, the, the genre of protest. I co-hosted with Lenny Sloan, my great African, American and Irish uh, he'd be my blood brother, I suppose. We'd be doing a program together called Two Roads to Verge now for uh, nearly 25 years in different parts of America and beyond uh, on the theme of racism. Uh, and, uh, and, and Lenny and myself co-hosted. And here's what I said then and what I still believe on the subject of Irish Americans and Irish people and racism. After I came to America in 1973, I lived in Philadelphia for the next 30 years and 28 of those years I spent in Germantown, an overwhelmingly African-American part of the city. And I saw the daily sight of white motorists rolling up the windows in their cars and locking the doors when they were driving through the hood. I became familiar with the daily indignities suffered by young black men. How? When they went to a supermarket, they were often followed around by security guards, observing their every movement. Their mothers would tell them always to be sure and get a receipt for everything they bought and always have ID with them wherever they went. The list of daily indignities went on and on. I must say I enjoyed those 30 years immensely and was awed by the humor, warmth, and in particular, the patience and tolerance of my African-American neighbors. In the early 1990s, I made my first trip to Montserrat, which is often known as the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean, and I was fascinated about that. I was curious about the Irish identity that the island was known for in general. And then when I went, I learned that most of the people there had Irish names and that we Irish had become slave owners there after originally being transplanted forcibly to the West Indies as indentured servants as far back as the 17th century. I learned that the so-called Black Irish of Montserrat were mostly not Irish at all, but African Caribbean people who had taken their Irish names from their masters because they had no English names of their own. There are those recently who for their own reasons have equated the suffering of the Irish transplanted by the likes of Oliver Cromwell to the Caribbean for indentured servitude to the suffering of Africans in slavery. But while we may have suffered the same indignities and sufferings, only our labor was sold, never our bodies. In slavery, as we know, the whole body and progeny of the body became the property of the slave owner. That never happened to us. During my many visits to Montserrat, I met the distinguished historian Howard Fergus, uh, and he makes this point as well. He wrote this book, uh, The History of the Island of Montserrat, and uh, I'd like to quote from him on the chapter uh, that is titled Irish and African Emancipation. There was really no comparison between the horrors of black slavery and the discrimination against Irish Catholics in Montserrat, but both groups in their different ways hankered after freedom. The slaves needed basic personal liberty, while the Irish always struggled for civil and political equality with other whites. The latter achieved their goal six years before emancipation, but this was no more the fruit of human kindness than was emancipation purely the result of humanitarian action. Freedom. We both longed and still long for freedom and social justice, basically an even playing field for all. 
We Irish Americans of all people have absolutely no right whatever to be racist at any time. We must not forget that not too long ago, we newly arrived Irish along with African Americans were considered by the American establishment, the wealthy and the powerful, as barely human. In fact, as subhuman. Irish Americans, of course, are now part of our privileged establishment in the United States, but we must never cease to remember the struggle our forebears went through when they arrived in the land of liberty. The next thing that happened after Infinite Hope was that uh, I was commissioned by Rachel Gilkey, the programming director of the Irish Arts Centre, to do a weekly series uh, of songs or tunes with a story about the context or the history of the song. And I said, sure, I'd love to do that. And it will keep me occupied uh, in this indefinite period of lockdown and enable me to perform with musicians uh, all over the world in a way that might not even be possible uh, if I were living in New York. Um, so off I went and I did two of them. And then on the 2nd of October, I got hit by a runaway pickup truck and it broke my hip in two places and damaged my right leg uh, so badly that I couldn't walk for three months. Uh, so I was on crutches for the next three months, but luckily my hands weren't affected and the head seemed to be working okay. So uh, it didn't stop me at all and I didn't feel I had any right to complain given the alternative possible consequences. The trouble was that I didn't have any of my instruments with me. Uh, this banjo here, uh, the old Vega banjo, my trusted Vega, which I've had for over 30 years. I played it occasionally on stage, but left it here in Bangkok for the most part. But I had no other instruments that were professional in the sense that I've, I'd ever played them on a stage or would ever want to play them on a stage. But I assembled them and made my peace with them. There were two octave mandolins. The one on the far left there was sent to me by Tom Cusson from Clarenbridge, County Galway. He's a great maker of banjos, but he also sells other instruments. And I called him up and said, help. So he sent me an octave mandolin made in Portugal. The one beside it is an octave mandolin made over 15 years ago in Vietnam on Music Row in Ho Chi Minh City, which is a copy a $40 copy of a very expensive instrument made by George Abrahams, a luthier in New Hampshire. And then the instrument right in the middle there is a mandolin made in China, uh, which Tom also sold me some years back and I brought it here to Bangkok just to play around the house. Beside that is a guitar I bought uh, in November here in Bangkok, a Takamine guitar. Uh, made in, in Japan. And on the right hand side is a guitar I bought a good many years ago. Just leave it around the house to play. And it's from uh, Korea. It's a Fina guitar. So you have a guitar from Portugal, a guitar from Japan, uh, a mandolin from China, an octave mandolin from Vietnam, and another octave mandolin from Portugal, a veritable League of Nations of Instruments. Well, the song that I've chosen to sing uh, for this particular project, Grosta, uh, or Grace uh, Under Times of Uncertainty, is a song called Airden's Green Shore. And it belongs to the, the genre that's known in Irish poetry and in song likewise uh, as the Ashling genre. The Ashling means a dream. Uh, and uh, it's a dream vision. Uh, the poet or the songwriter falls asleep uh, and then has a dream where uh, he's visited by a beautiful woman uh, and the woman is in bondage, in trouble. Uh, and it's a symbol of Ireland, uh, the motherland, being held in bondage under colonial rule, under oppression. Uh, and, uh, and that's described symbolically in the song. And then uh, the poet or the songwriter wakes up uh, and, and, and the woman is gone, but the message remains. In a sense, of course, this whole lockdown has been uh, a dream, like a dream, uh, certainly for me, uh, removed from all the people that I normally perform with and yet managing uh, remotely to connect with them all uh, and, and to enjoy uh, the beauty of folk music and, and traditional music and, uh, and dancing woven in whenever appropriate. Erin's uh, Green Shore is a song that uh, I, I learned uh, 
I can't remember who I learned it from. Back in the 1990s, I believe, and I recorded it not long after that for an album called Far From The Shamrock Shore. I don't remember singing it at all since then, maybe once or twice. Um, there's nothing I love more than, than harmony singing. Um, and, and this song lends itself to harmony. It's a song found uh, in, in, in the Irish tradition. It's also found a lot in the Appalachian tradition, particularly in Virginia. And uh, it's one of those powerful songs that is imaginatively relevant in every generation. And as the late Mike Seeger once said, you know, every time you sing an old song, by definition, it's a contemporary song because you're singing it now, in the here and now. And there's nothing I, I love more in the here and now and have loved in my lifetime of, of being an artist. There's nothing I love more than harmony singing. And I did it back in, in the days of the Johnstons, back in the 1960s. And I'm delighted to sing this song with two great harmony singers, two the great lead singers as well, uh, John Doyle in Asheville, North Carolina, and Liz Hanley in Boston. And we're going to be accompanied by one of the greatest fiddlers uh, ever in the Appalachian tradition, a man I've known and admired for many, many decades. And we performed together, uh, recorded together over the years. And it's Bruce Molsky, and I believe he's recording this in New York. So with Bruce Molsky on the fiddle and with John Doyle on harmony vocals and Liz Hanley on harmony vocals, Ern's Greenshore. One evening of late as I rambled On the banks of a clear purling stream I sat down on a bed of primroses And I gently fell into a dream I dreamed I beheld fair female, her equal I have never seen before, as she sighed for the wrongs of her country, as she strayed along Aaron's green shore. I went to her and I quickly addressed her. Fair maid, will you tell me your name? And why through this wild wooded country In the midst of these dangers you came? I'm a daughter of Daniel O'Connell And from England Stars on a bright frosty night, and her cheeks were like two blooming roses, and her teeth of the ivy so white. She resembled a goddess of freedom, and we were. Transports of joy I awoke then And found I had been in a dream For this beautiful damsel had fled me 
and I long for to slumber again. May the heavens above be her guardian, for I know I shall see her no more. May the sunbeams of glory shine over her as she strays along there.